Good morning, Crossroads. Pastor Joey here. Welcome to Church Online with us. We're happy to have you here. A special welcome to anyone who's maybe visiting or just checking us out. I've talked to a few different people who've said, it's really nice during this season. I can kind of go to church anywhere and see what's going on. So welcome if that's you. If you're just checking us out this morning, we're glad to have you. First thing I want to share this morning is it is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day, moms. We just want to thank you so much for all that you do for us. We love you and we want to celebrate you this morning. If you forgot, this is your chance. You didn't, it's not too late. Go ahead and celebrate with your mom this morning and let her know how much you appreciate her. Next thing is I want to let you know about an exciting opportunity coming up, which is that we have a small group starting. We haven't been able to meet and do small groups lately. So we're going to experiment and try to meet on Zoom. Uh, and right now we have uh, Marilyn Swedberg and Matt Hobbs who are excited to lead a group of people through this study. Anyone can sign up. Uh, it's going to take place on Zoom. It's just going to be for six weeks and it's going to start up real soon here. Uh, the details will be coming out in an email this week. And the topic, as you can see, is going to be um, from a, a, a book that Max Licato wrote called Anxious for Nothing. And the subtitle here, if it's hard to read, is Finding Calm in a Chaotic World. And right now, of course, we have some chaos that's been inserted into our world. So if that's a topic that interests you, or if you've just been looking for an opportunity to connect with other people in the body on a regular basis, this is a way for you to do that. Um, as many people as one can sign up, and we, if we have more, we'll just make more groups. So go ahead, look for that email coming out this week with more details, and get signed up for a small group. The last thing this morning is that we are going to do round four of trivia. So Tuesday night, get ready. Uh, start forming your teams, invite your friends, and this time we are going to celebrate the decades together through trivia. So come dressed up in your favorite decade, um, you know, put your ball cap on for the 90s and your sunglasses, your baggy pants, whatever. Um, get your big hair out for the 80s, 70s, I don't know. You can figure it out. I trust you. We will celebrate the decades together and have some questions from specific decades um, in our different rounds of trivia. It's been a lot of fun. If you've missed out, I invite you to come and join us. And I promise there'll be no mention of cats this Tuesday night. So come out and join us for trivia. We're going to have a lot of fun. And then lastly this morning, just want to say again, thanks for coming to worship with us together. Just a reminder, I'll include some links for some worship songs uh, in the email that you received this or in the description of the YouTube video. You can find those there if you want to sing along with your family and worship God. Pretty soon, hopefully in the near future, we'll even be able to um, have our worship team recording some music or be able to gather live. So praying for that. But in the meantime, I encourage you to worship with your family and enjoy the sermon here from Pastor Mick as we continue in our series called Age of Kings. Today we'll be looking at King Hezekiah. So I'll pass it off to Mick. Have a great morning. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith, trust, we talk about it a lot in church. What is this all about? What's the big deal? In the mid-19th century, there was a man named Charles Blundeen, who was the most famous tightrope walker of the era. It is estimated that in his lifetime, he crossed Niagara Falls on a tightrope over 300 times. And every time he went across, he made it more exciting than the last time he went across. This is a story that is told that one time he walked across Niagara Falls pushing a wheelbarrow full of rocks. When he got to the other side, he approached the crowd and they were all cheering and everything was so exciting. And he turned to the crowd and he asked them a question. He said, do you believe that I can take a person in this wheelbarrow across to the other side? To which the crowd cheered and yelled, yes, yes, we think you can do it. We've watched you. You can do it. You can do it. And as they all quieted down, he said, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Who will get in the wheelbarrow? And as you can imagine, a hush developed. That's faith. That's what faith means. You see, it's one thing to say, yeah, we believe you can. It's another thing altogether to get in the wheelbarrow. Today, we're going to talk about King Hezekiah and how King Hezekiah got in the wheelbarrow and how you and I need to get in the wheelbarrow. And that's what God is after for you and I. So let's take our Bibles, let's get ready, and let's talk about Hezekiah. Good morning, Crossroads. Thanks for joining us today. Hopefully you've got your Bibles now. If you haven't already done so, you're gonna to wanna to pull out your Bible app, pull out the notes that we're gonna have on there, um, and take your Bibles and go to 2 Kings chapter 18, 19, and 20. That's kind of where we are today. 
Um, and today we're talking about faith. And um, Hezekiah is one of my favorite kings. And I think you'll understand why here in just a minute. But if you haven't done so already, pause the video, go back and read those chapters so you can be familiar with the story of Hezekiah as we're going to kind of unfold uh, his story today. Today. All right. Glad you're back. In Hezekiah, in, in 2 Kings chapter 18, in verse 5, this is what it says about Hezekiah. And it says that Hezekiah trusted the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. This is what the story is about today. And, and as I lay the groundwork a little bit for you today, Hezekiah was one of the kings of Judah. And um, if you've been kind of studying the kings or looking back, we well, last week we did Asa. We talked about Asa. Hezekiah is about 200 years later, okay? So we're 200 years later in the history of Israel and Judah. Israel is the northern kingdom. Judah is the southern kingdom. Now let me pause for just a minute to give you a little bit of background. I won't go into a lot. But remember, we studied Saul. And, and Saul messed up and David became king, right? Remember David, then David, then there was Solomon. And then Solomon was a good king, and he built the temple, and wisest man who ever lived. And he started out really great, but then in his later years, a lot like Asa we talked about last week, he, his faith, his heart began to wane for God. Well, he had a son named Rehoboam. Rehoboam became the third king of Israel in David's succession there, David, Solomon, Rehoboam. Well, Rehoboam really did some foolish things. And a long story short, he didn't listen to his wise counselors. He listened to a bunch of his friends that he grew up with, and he ended up splitting the kingdom in half during the reign of Rehoboam. And so Rehoboam, who was in Jerusalem, Jerusalem became the center or the, the capital of the southern tribes of Judah, as well as some others, but it was called Judah. And then the northern tribes of Israel um, followed a guy named Jeroboam, and they made their um, capital in Samaria and Damascus, okay? So that whole thing uh, became the center for the northern tribe. And for the next 200 years, um, actually for the next um, three centuries almost, you had these two um, nations and they often were at war with each other and it was bad, even though they were brethren, even though they were, they were all Israelites. Um, that's kind of what's going on. So now we come to Hezekiah and he's about 200 years after Asa and um, Hezekiah is one of those kings, remember I said last week that you have to look for those kings that did right in the sight of the Lord. Well, Hezekiah stands above the rest because it says not only did he trust God, there was no one like him. No one had this kind of heart among the kings of Judah. Okay, this doesn't include David. Remember, David was the, he was the standard, if you will, a man after God's own heart. But Hezekiah stands head and shoulders above all the others, including, including Asa from last week, in following God and trusting God. And today's story, um, we're going to kind of unpack in the life of Hezekiah um, his faith, and more importantly today, how God tested his faith, okay? Now, I don't know about you, I don't know how long you've been a Christian, if you've been a Christian for a long time, but if you, if you have been a Christian for a little while and you look back on kind of your time as a Christian, there probably was some times where you were going along and you were on fire for God, some of the passion we talked about last week, and you were, you were serving in ministry and you were doing things and your family was doing great, everything was going great, and then all of a sudden, bam, something hits you. Something got in the way. There was an obstacle. There was a valley. There was something that got in the way of your faith. And it was like, whoa, why is this happening to me? And, and maybe you had a rough time with God through it. Or maybe you fell on your knees and you trusted God through it. But there was something that happened. And I'm here to tell you that that is not unusual. That in fact... Um, God's number one goal for you and I, don't miss this point, God's number one goal for you and I is for our, to put our faith and trust in Him and that our faith and trust in Him would grow deeper and stronger every single day. That every day you roll out of bed, that you will trust God and love God a little bit more 
today than you did yesterday. That's God's goal for you. That's why I talked about that passage in, in Hebrews 11 that says, look, it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is what it's about. God yearns for us to love him and trust him and put our faith in him. And so along the way, there will be times where God puts our faith to the test. And so over the next two weeks, this week and next week, as we study Hezekiah, I want to show you four tests, four tests that all of us can go through. Some of you will go through all of them. Some of you will go through a few of them. But God will always put your faith to the test. Now, hold on for just a second, because here's the deal. I often, um, I often wondered why God would test us. Because after all, God knows everything. Why would God have to give us an exam? Why would God have to test our faith? Because he already knows how good our faith is, right? And then as I began to think and I began to ponder about it, it dawned on me that when God puts us through a test, it's not for his information, it's for our information. In other words, God puts us for, through a test not so that he can be informed about where your faith is because he already knows that. It's so that you and I can see where our faith is, see the failings, see the holes, see the shortfalls in our faith and be able to grow as a result, to be able to shore that up and be better about it, right? That's what God is about. And that's why he tests us. It's not for his knowledge. He already knows, but he wants us to know because when we know where our faith is, is our faith here? Is our faith here? Then if it's here or it's here, we know what we've got to do. There's a shortfall. We've got to build that up with these things we can do to make it stronger, right? And God helps us with that. That's what the tests are all about. And there's, there are these tests that, that as I give them to you, they happened in Hezekiah, but they also happened throughout the, Old, uh, throughout the Old Testament, throughout the kings and others in the Old Testament. I think you'll recognize some of them. And the first test that Hezekiah faced is what I call the giant test. Okay? It's that giant test. And you and I, this is, this is one of the most um, prevalent tests for you and I if, if we've been Christians for a while. It's that that thing that stands in our way, that obstacle, that giant that seems, that seems impossible, that seems, you know, it's a mountain that you don't think you can climb, or it's a, it's a, it's a valley you don't think you can cross, it's a pit you don't think you can get out of, it's something that is standing in your way, something that has happened that just seems impossible. It's David and Goliath. Last week, Asa faced that giant, remember? When that nation came, came against him and, and th those Ethiopians attacked and he trusted God and God worked a miracle, Gideon faced the same thing when he faced the Midianites. It was a giant of a test. And Hezekiah faces the same thing, all right? And so if you have your Bibles, kind of here's what's going on, all right? I'm not going to read the whole story, but I'm going to give you the gist of what's happening. So Hezekiah... Um, Hezekiah comes to power uh, right around 725 BC, okay? Right around 725, 726, somewhere in there. Now, what's happening in the, in the world um, around them is that the Assyrians are coming to power. The Assyrian Empire, if you remember that from, from your school uh, from days gone by, the Assyrians were coming into power. And um, because the northern kingdom had just, they had, they didn't have any good kings. They were all bad news. It was, and God had sent prophets like Elijah and Elisha to try to turn the northern kingdoms around, and they didn't want nothing to do it, and they're worshiping idols, and they're doing all kinds of bad stuff, right? You go back and read some of those stories. Well, finally, God had had enough. And so God brought the Assyrians in, and they conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And that happened in 722 BC. And they were carted off to the Assyrian Empire as slaves and the whole deal, right? And so now you've got the southern kingdom of Judah there, the northern kingdom, all their brethren have been taken away, and now Assyria is starting to encroach on them. And a couple years later now, the Assyrians begin to march on Judah. 
Now, at first, this giant of a problem, because these guys, like in every other case we've, we've studied in the, in the Old Testament, these, these guys have lots of soldiers, and they're just an overwhelming. And at this time for Hezekiah, he didn't have the resources that just a couple hundred years earlier Asa did. Remember, Asa had like 600,000 troops and all that. No, 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 Hezekiah didn't have that. It had dwindled down. His army was small in comparison. So now the Assyrians come, and, and, and uh, Hezekiah does what a lot of us do when we're faced with a giant. He went for the quick fix. He went for the easy out. He, in a lot of ways like Asa did, he went into the temple. He took all the gold and silver and all this kind of stuff. Because what had happened is, is that a little bit prior, while the Assyrians were kind of taking over the northern tribe and they were kind of the, the big man on, on campus, if you will, uh, uh, in the neighborhood, um, they were before they conquered some nations, they would go to these nations and say, hey, you need to give us tribute. You need to pay stuff to us so that we don't bully you and all that. And for a while before Hezekiah, the southern kingdom was giving money to the Assyrians to keep them nice, right? Well, when Hezekiah came to power, he rebelled against that agreement. He rebelled against that, that situation that his predecessors had done. And so he had stopped making payments to the Assyrians, well, now once the Assyrians finished with the northern kingdom, now they were like, hey, we're coming to get you. You stop paying us. So then Hezekiah freaks out. He goes for the quick fix and he grabs all this cash and he goes to them. He's like, hey, hey, I'm so sorry I wasn't paying you like I should. He kind of wimped out there and he threw some money at them hoping that they'd go away. Well, the quick fix didn't work. And you and I know what that's like, don't we? Right? How many times have you faced that obstacle, if you faced that that problem, that thing that's kind of got in your way. You don't know where it came from, but there it is. And it seems to be blocking your path. It seems to be in the way and, and keeping you from moving ahead and whatever that, the case may be. It's there. It's a mountain. It just, it's just crazy. And you go for the quick fix. Remember that story I told you, that illustration? I did that when I was going through that midlife crisis back in 2008. And I got scared and, and I felt trapped and my friend called me up and offered me a job and I went for it. It was that quick release. It was that, okay, you know, instead of pausing and thinking and praying and, 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 and thinking it through like I should have and trusting God through the situation, I went for the quick fix. You know what that's like. We've all been there, right? We know what it is to face the giant. And I don't know what the giant is in your world, and maybe it's a giant now, or maybe it was a giant years ago. Maybe you faced the giant several times. For, for, for you right now, it may be a, the, the giant uh, that, that seems impossible to, to, to be able to rectify the financial situation and the current culture and the, the crisis we're in, and am I gonna have a job, and all these fears and all this kind of stuff. You don't know how you're gonna move forward. You don't know how you're gonna succeed. You don't know how you're gonna feed your family. There's this giant obstacle in the way, and it's, and it's an unknown, and it's fearful, and you don't know what to do about it. Well, I'm here to tell you, be weary of the quick fix. Be wary of the dump that, go there really fast. Trust God. That's what needs to happen. Don't go for the quick fix. Don't go for the easy out. The easy out hardly ever solves any problem. God wants to help you with this giant problem. He faced the giant. The Assyrians invade Judah. Well, as you look at the story... Uh, the, the, the quick fix didn't work. They march into Judah. They come up to the gates of Jerusalem and they start, I mean, you got to read this. Sennacherib, who was kind of a, the, the, the chief of staff, commander of the army kind of guy, he starts mocking God. He starts shouting to the people to surrender and don't listen to Hezekiah and don't listen to his words about God, no God is going to rescue you. None of the other nations around us, their gods didn't rescue them. Your God's not going to rescue you. Don't listen to him. I mean, it's bad. And the people um, are, are fearful. And the, the, the emissaries that Hezekiah sends out comes back and tells Hezekiah all of this message. And he runs immediately, chapter 19. He, he puts on um, 
tore his clothes, verse 1, and he put on burlap and went into the temple of the Lord. So he goes into the temple and he starts to pray and he immediately sends word to the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah is alive during the time of Hezekiah. And in fact, this story of Hezekiah is also found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 36 through 39, as well as in 2 Chronicles, chapter 29 through 32. So Hezekiah's story is told three different times in, this, in these passages in the Old Testament. So Hezekiah is praying, and he sends word to Isaiah of all that's transpired, and he asks Isaiah to pray to God, and God sends back word. And uh, verse 5, and after Hezekiah's officials delivered the king's message to Isaiah, the prophet replied, Say to your master, this is what the Lord says, Do not be disturbed by this blasphemous speech against me from the Assyrian king's messengers. Listen, he said, verse 7, I myself will move against him, and the king will receive a message that he is needed at home, so he will return to his land where I will have him killed with a sword. So God reassures Hezekiah. Well, sure enough, Sennacherib goes, and, and, and the king of Assyria is somewhere else doing some battling and fighting, and he goes to see him, and word gets back that those pesky Ethiopians that we dealt with a couple hundred years ago they're attacking the Assyrians in another direction, similar to what we saw happen last week. So as the Assyrians are withdrawing to go take care of the Ethiopians, just to get a final jab in, this Sennacherib and this king send word back to Hezekiah and to Judah saying, hey, just in case you think that uh, you're okay, you're not okay, because nobody's going to protect you against us, and we'll be back, and you'll be sorry. I mean, it's bad. And then Hezekiah, in verse 14, And after Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the Lord's temple and he spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed, watch this in verse 15, He prayed this prayer before the Lord, O Lord God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sennacherib's words of defiance against the living God. Then down to verse 19. Now, O Lord, our God, rescue us from his power. Then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. And I love, as you go through these passages, the Lord speaks back through um, Isaiah, and he says down in verse 20, I have heard your prayer. I love that. You know, sometimes when we're facing a giant, sometimes when we're facing the unknown, and we don't know what's going to happen, and we don't know how we can move forward, and we don't know how we can defeat this enemy, and we don't know how we can progress, and we pray, sometimes it doesn't feel like God hears us. And yet you and I need to trust him, and we need to be reassured that God hears us when we cry out to him. As we said last week, when we're seeking after him, when we're searching for him, he will come to you and be found by you and, and allow you to find him. God hears us when we pray. He really does. So take comfort in that. So, so he faced this giant, this giant test. And here's, here's kind of the the, the, the point or the principle for the giant test that you and I need to remember. It's this on your outline, that giants are always big. Giants are always big. But our God is bigger. Listen, listen. There is no giant that you will ever face. There is no giant. I don't care how big, how tall, how strong. I don't know how impossible it seems. There is no mountain too high. There is no valley too low that our God is not bigger and stronger and capable of climbing and crossing. Our God is bigger. The giants are big and make no mistake about it that when God sends that test of a giant in your world, that giant is going to seem impossible. Just like David and Goliath, as little shepherd boy David faced a nine foot behemoth of a man, a warrior. I mean, huge. He was scary. He was big. And yet David put his faith in God and you and I must do the same thing. 
And we must always remember that no matter how big the giant is, no matter how scary it seems, our God is always bigger. He is. He's bigger. I know for me, there have been some giants in my life. I remember in 2004, um, I was, I was uh, in ministry um, in a church like this, about twice as large as, as this church, and I was doing ministry and adult-type stuff, and, and uh, things were great. I just bought a house, and, and, and um, my kids were, were, were there. I mean, it was just great and comfortable, and it was great. Um, and then God came to me, and he said, Mick, I want you to start a church. And it was like, I pushed back and I pushed back and I was like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm comfortable, God, I'm okay, I don't want to do that. And after six months, I finally came to God and said, okay, God, I'll do it. But you have to do all these list of things that I want. Da, 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 da. Here's all the things you got to do if you want me to do that. And God, in the, over the next three months, came back and took everything off my list. Said, nope, not going to do that, not going to do that, not going to do that, 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 none of it but I still want you to do it. And I was left. Here I am, got my family, no job, no income, no support. I had one worship guy that was willing to work with me and a credit card. And that's all I had to start this church. And I had never started a church before. And I had no idea what was going to happen. I had no idea if it was going to fall flat on its face and what was going to happen. There was, talk about fear. Talk about jumping into the unknown. I mean, it was like, wow. But you know what? God was bigger than that giant. And when God asks us to do something, and when God calls us to something, no matter how high that mountain is, no matter how low that valley looks, God will get us through. There is nothing too big for him. I know there was another time in 2010. 2010, I was in ministry, and I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and the economy collapsed in Phoenix. And the, the, the housing bubble burst and all of a sudden everybody was panicking and dumping their homes. And I mean, it was just bad. And I remember working at this, at this really large church and they had to start laying off staff. And after the first two rounds of staff layoffs, it's the third round of staff layoffs. And finally, I got that pink slip. I, I, I got that slip that said, look, we, we love you, you're doing a great job, but we can't keep you. And I found myself for the first time in 15 years in ministry, out of ministry, not having a ministry job. And what am I gonna do? And, and, and I, I got like five part-time jobs and scrambling and my wife was working and it was just crazy. And it was terrible and I didn't know how we were gonna, gonna make it through and I didn't know what the answer was and it was miserable at the time. And I, and I got angry. There was, I mean, it was just bad. But God carried us through and God got us through as we stayed faithful and we trusted in him. And God opened the doors in ways that I could never imagine. He provided financially in ways I could never imagine. I could give you story after story after story about how God showed up. And it was like, where did that come from? How is, and that's what happens when you and I choose to trust in God. Our giants, whatever giant it is you're facing right now, and maybe it's COVID-19 related, or maybe it's relational or something or something in your career or whatever. I don't know what the giant is, but I'm here to tell you that God will put a giant in your path to test your faith, to see where you are. Will you trust him? As our illustration before, will you get in the wheelbarrow? It's one thing for us to stand back when everything is hunky-dory, everything's rosy, and everything's great, and go, yeah, I believe you, God. I trust God. I sing the songs. I even raise my hand on occasion during worship. It's another thing altogether to get in the, get in the wheelbarrow, right? And you and I have to remember that God wants us to trust him. God wants us to believe in him and put our faith in him no matter what. More and more every single day. That's his number one goal for you. So he's going to put giants in your path. Don't back down. Trust him. 
Jesus said in Matthew 19, 26, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible, right? You remember that quote? With God, all things are possible. And no matter what crisis you face, no matter how big the giant, God is always bigger. Then there was another test. And the thing about this is, is right after this test, and God did, God answered, just like he did last week with Asa, when he trusted, just like when David trusted, it was, a, it was an, an awesome moment. And sure enough, um, the, the Assyrians pulled back, and, and because of this letter, God sent an angel into their camp, killed 185,000 of them overnight, to which they opened up, uh, you know, they woke up the next day and all these corpses are everywhere and they, they left in disgrace. They were just, it was like, wow, God really showed up. And then the king went back and ended up getting killed in, in, uh, by his two sons while he was worshiping in uh, his temple. I and mean, it, was, it was bad. So God took care of them, right? But right on the heels of this, and this is, this is interesting because, you know, God sometimes sends tests and sometimes he sends waves of tests, not just one at a time. He might send several right in a row. And he did so with Hezekiah. And this is what I call the personal test. You see, sometimes the giant test, that's, a, that's an obstacle that's in your way. That's a Something that's standing there, it's opposing you, it's, it's preventing you, it's something there, right? That's the giant test. It's big and overwhelming, but it, it's there. The personal test is, is just what it sounds. It's more personal in nature. It's, it's when, you remember in Job, how when, 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 when the devil was, was, was testing Job, and, and was, was afflicting him. He started on the periphery, remember that? And it started with his children and his stuff. And then the devil went back and said, now I want to touch Job's body. I want to touch him. I want to make it personal, right? That's kind of what I'm talking about. It's the test that goes beyond this to this. And Hezekiah suffered the same kind of a test in chapter 20, look at this now. Go to chapter 20, beginning in verse 1 now. So all this stuff, the Assyrians just got defeated. They're, they're slinking back home. It's right on the heels of all this. And about that time, chapter 20, verse 1, and about that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. So here, there's this great victory. He prays, God rescues him, God does this cool stuff, it's time for celebration, but just as he's celebrating, just as things are, yay, God is good, he gets sick. He gets deathly sick. And then watch, watch. And the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, went to visit him. And he gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order, for you are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. Talk about a dagger in the heart. I mean, God, we just had this great victory. God, we just overcame this thing. You did, and, and we watched, and we praised you, and it was awesome. And now all of a sudden, ah, uh, and it hits home, and he gets sick. And, and more than just sick, because when you and I get sick, there's always that, you know, hope or prayer for recovery and all this kind of stuff. No, no, no. God compiled on this test and said, not only are you sick and I'm, and I'm allowing you to get sick here, but I'm sending word to you that you're not going to recover. You're going to die. That doesn't get more personal than that, right? And there will come times in your life as a Christian, if you are a Christian, there will come times in your walk with God when God will test you on a personal level. And, and some of you, even as you sit here and you listen to this, you remember the giants in your life and you remember how God conquered and God, how God used you. But even as I begin to talk about this kind of a test, some of you have felt it. Some of you haven't. 
And you may or may not, I don't know. This is just a tool that God uses, but sometimes, sometimes the test will be personal. And for him, it touched his body. For you, it may be the same. Some of you listening to this, you may be suffering from some kind of an illness that took you out of, uh, out of nowhere. And maybe it's a debilitating kind of thing, or maybe it's a, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with you, but I just, this is what God does sometimes. Because remember, God always wants to test us and tell us to get in the wheelbarrow. And some of you have passed the giant test enough that God is saying, okay, now I need to get more personal. I need to make sure. Just like when the devil tempted Job. The devil kind of knew that, that the periphery, even though it was his children, and, and, and that for most of us, how could it get more personal than that? But it did. Let me touch his body to see what he does. And for some of us, we face that. And it got personal. And it hurt more. It, it, th there was something. I, I, I'll give you an example. My wife and I, um, we were foster parents for a number of years, for many years. And um, we had, uh, when we first became foster parents, we got these two kids in our home. Well, um, the, the girl was a four-month-old baby girl and her brother who was three at the time and we took them into our home and now this is probably yeah um 2000 2011 2012 something like that 2012 maybe and we took them early early into our home and they lived with us um and hannah was born um about three months later after we got these kids. And so we're raising these children. And in the foster system, if anybody knows anything about the foster system, um, the foster system, at least in Arizona, and I think it's true everywhere, but the foster system always defaults to trying to find family members, okay? Family members is who they want to have the kids go to, you know, permanently kind of thing. Well, when we started with these children, we were told from day one almost that there was no chance these kids were going back to their mom and that we were going to have an opportunity if we wanted to adopt them. And as we progressed, we had these children um, the better part of two years. All right. So this four month old baby grows up. She's now two and a half, three years old in our home. Um, we, we're the only parents really that she knows. I'm dad. Catherine is mom. I mean, these are, and we want to adopt them. We've told the caseworkers we want to adopt them and we, we, we're treating them like they're our children um, as we progress along and the mother is just not getting her act together and, you know, not able to. Um, and then came the day and there were some other things that happened and, and other things like that. But the bottom line is that the system came and told us that they were going to be taking the kids out of our home. And I remember the heartache. I remember just, and I went to bat and I, and I did everything that I could but there was another family that had stepped up that was closer in, you know, relatives kind of thing, who was going to adopt them. And I remember, I remember the heartache. I remember the day they came to take my daughter away and my son away. And I had our family gathered around these children and I had never really witnessed my children weep the way I saw them weep that day. I mean, they were ripping our hearts out and there was nothing we could do about it. And I, I remember, I remember crying like I have never cried before. I've suffered loss. My mother died um, a number of years ago and 
I cried during that, but, but this, 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 this felt like a child dying, just a little. And my, my insides felt like they were going to fall apart. And I, and I cried and I cried and I prayed and I prayed and I asked God to give me back my children. And I will tell you that through it all, through that anguish, through that hurt, that God did show up. He didn't bring the children back. And to this day, they're with that family that ended up adopting them, and that was a good thing for them. And, and they, had, they actually had another one of their siblings they had adopted prior to all of this, kind of a middle sibling between the two we had. There was another sibling that they had adopted prior. So now all three of the siblings are together, and that's a good thing. But in this test, for me, I had to cling to God like there was no tomorrow. It was the only thing that kept me sane. And I'm here to tell you, listen, listen, that through these tests, through, through this kind of thing, the answer isn't always going to be healing. Because for Hezekiah, look what happened with Hezekiah. And when Hezekiah heard this, verse 2 now, he turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord, Remember, O Lord, how I have always been faithful to you and have served you single-mindedly, always doing what pleases you. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. But before Isaiah had left the middle of the courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of your ancestor David, says. I have heard your prayer. That's that statement again. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you, and three days from now you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life, and I will rescue you and this city from the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my own honor and for the sake of my servant David. See, for Hezekiah, God answered and healed him. But you need to understand that that's not always going to be God's answer. There are going to be times where, where God calms the storm, and then there are going to be times where God calms your heart. And that's what he did for me. We didn't get the kids back, and I mean, I prayed more and harder than I have prayed for anything in my life. And God didn't respond the way I wanted him to. But he responded, and he held me close, and he got me through it. Because I, honestly, I walked around in a daze for weeks, not knowing if the sun would shine again in our world. My children were, were, were deeply hurt by this. And yet, through it all, God was there. And three weeks later, God brought joy back to our life. And my daughter, Joy, was born. And that's why we named her Joy. Because during a very dark time in our world, a dark time where I really didn't know if the sun would ever shine again, God showed his goodness and his strength and gave us joy again. And he can do that for you. And whether it's calming the storm or calming your heart and carrying you through the storm, I don't know how God will respond. But I do know that the point is not to make you miserable. The point is not just to wreck your life. The point is for God asking you to get in the wheelbarrow. And God is asking you to trust him to trust him through the storms, to trust him with the giants, to trust him with the personal issues and things we face. God wants us to trust him.
to put our faith in him more today than yesterday and the day before that. That's why the tests come. And so on number two on your outline, under the personal test, the principle is this, that nothing in life is set in stone unless God does the setting. In other words, the, the prophet came to, to Hezekiah and said, look, Hezekiah, you're going to die. This is a bad disease and, you know, this is, you're done. So get your affairs in order. And instead of just going, okay, that's what God says. I'm just going to, no, no, no. He prayed. He, he turned to the wall. He wept and he prayed before God. And I'm here to tell you that prayer changes things. That God hears us when we pray. And nothing in life is set in stone unless God does the setting. So no matter what you're facing, no matter what the malady is or the, the personal test that you're going through, whether it's an illness or it's something in regards to your close family, but I mean it's close and it's personal. No matter what it is, nothing is set in stone. No situation, no relationship is too far gone. No child is too far gone that, that God can't turn around and do something. If we get on our knees, if we pray and we put it before him and then let his will be done, not ours. See, and ultimately that's what we're talking about. That's what getting in the wheelbarrow is all about. It's about trusting him with the outcome. It's about trusting Him that He knows what's best and crying out to Him and letting Him comfort us through this. These are the first two tests that Hezekiah had to go through, the giant test, the personal test. Next week, we're going to talk about two more tests that Hezekiah had to go through that are similar and, and things that you and I probably will go through if we've been a Christian for any length of time. But I want you to, this week, I want you to think about these two tests. Are you facing a giant test? Are you facing a personal test? Maybe they're both one and the same. Are you trusting? Are you getting in the wheelbarrow with God? Are you uh, allowing Him to guide you? Are you trusting in the outcome to be uh, in His hands and not in your hands? I hope so. Take this week to think that through. And to remember, no matter how big the giant, God's always bigger and that nothing is set in stone unless God does the setting. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you for today. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the story of Hezekiah and the tests that his life um, brings to us. The tests he went through and how you and I, how, how we need to handle those same kind of tests as you put them in, in our way because you want us to know where our faith is, because you want us to trust in you, put our faith in you more and more every day. Help us to honor you that way, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us. God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week as we talk about Hezekiah again.